The great author had realized one of the dreams of his ambitious youth, the possession of an ancestral hall in England. It was not so much the good American's reverence for ancestors that inspired the longing to consort with the ghosts of an ancient line as artistic appreciation of the mellowness, the dignity, the aristocratic aloofness of walls that have sheltered and furniture that has embraced generations and generations of the dead. To mere wealth, only as astute and incomparably young brain yielded respect, his ego raised its goose flesh at the sight of rooms furnished with a single check, conciliatory as the taste might be. The dumping of the old interiors of Europe into the glistening shells of the United States not only roused him almost to passionate protest, but offended his patriotism, which he classified among his unworked ideals. The average American was not an artist, therefore he had no excuse for even the affectation of cosmopolitanism. Heaven knew he was national enough in everything else, from his accent to his lack of repose, let his surroundings be in keeping. Orth had left the United States soon after his first successes, and, his art being too great to be confounded with locality, he had long since ceased to be spoken of as an American author. All civilized Europe furnished stages for his puppets, and if never picturesque nor impassioned, his originality was as overwhelming as his style. His subtleties might not always be understood, indeed as a rule they were not, but the musical mystery of his language and the penetrating charm of his lofty and cultivated mind induced raptures in the initiated, forever denied to those who failed to appreciate him. His following was not a large one, but it was very distinguished. The aristocracies of the earth gave to it, and not to understand and admire Ralph Orth was deliberately to relegate oneself to the ranks. But the elect are few, and they frequently subscribe to the circulating libraries. On the continent, they buy the Tocknitz edition, and had not Mr. Orth inherited a sufficiency of ancestral dollars to enable him to keep rules in Germain Street and the wardrobe of an Englishman of leisure, he might have been forced to consider the tastes of the middle class at a desk in Hampstead. But as it mercifully was, the fashionable and exclusive sets of London knew and sought him. He was too wary to become a fad, and too sophisticated to grate or bore. Consequently, his popularity continued evenly from year to year, and long since he had come to be regarded as one of them. He was not keenly addicted to sport, but he could handle a gun, and all men respected his dignity and breeding. They cared less for his books than women did, perhaps because patience is not a characteristic of their sex. I am alluding, however, in this instance, to men of the world, a group of young literary men, and one or two women, put him on a pedestal and kissed the earth before it. Naturally, they imitated him, and as this flattered him, and he had a kindly heart deep among the sear cloths of his formality, he sooner or later wrote appreciations of them all, which nobody living could understand, but which, owing to the subtitle and signature, answered every purpose. With all this, however, he was not utterly content. From the 12th of August until late in the winter, when he did not go to Hamburg and the Riviera, he visited the best houses in England, slept in state chambers, and meditated in historic parks. But the country was his one passion, and he longed for his own acres. He was turning fifty when his great-aunt died, and made him heir as a poor reward for his immortal services to literature, read the will of this phenomenally appreciative relative. The estate was a large one. There was a rush for his books. New editions were announced. He smiled with cynicism, not unmixed with sadness. But he was very grateful for the money, and as soon as his fastidious taste would permit, he bought him a country seat. The place gratified all his ideals and dreams, for he had romanced about his sometime English possession as he had never dreamed of woman. 
It had once been the property of the church, and the ruin of cloister and chapel above the ancient wood was sharp against the low pale sky. Even the house itself was Tudor, but wealth from generation to generation had kept it in repair, and the lawns were as velvety, the hedges as rigid, the trees as aged as any in his own works. It was not a castle, nor a great property, but it was quite perfect, and for a long while he felt like a bridegroom on a succession of honeymoons. He often laid his hand against the rough ivied walls in a lingering caress. After a time he returned the hospitalities of his friends, and his invitations, given with the exclusiveness of his great distinction, were never refused. Americans visiting England eagerly sought for letters to him, and if they were sometimes benumbed by that cold and formal presence, and awed by the silences of Chillingsworth, the few who entered there, they thrilled in anticipation of verbal triumphs, and forthwith bought an entire set of his books. It was characteristic that they dared not ask him for his autograph. Although women invariably described him as brilliant, a few men affirmed that he was gentle and lovable, and any one of them was well content to spend weeks at Chillingsworth with no other companion. But on the whole, he was a rather lonely man. It occurred to him how lonely he was one gay June morning when the sunlight was streaming through his narrow windows, illuminating tapestries and armor, the family portraits of the young profligate from whom he had once made his purchase, dusting its gold on the black wood of wainscot and floor. He was in the gallery at the moment, studying one of his two favorite portraits, a gallant little lad in the green costume of Robin Hood. The boy's expression was imperious and radiant, and he had that perfect beauty which in any disposition appealed so powerfully to the author. But as Orth stared today at the brilliant youth, of whose life he knew nothing, he suddenly became aware of a human stirring at the foundations of his aesthetic pleasure. I wish he were alive and here, he thought with a sigh. What a jolly little companion he would be! And this fine old mansion would make a far more complimentary setting for him than for me. He turned away abruptly, only to find himself face to face with a portrait of a little girl who was quite unlike the boy, yet so perfect in her own way, and so unmistakably painted by the same hand, that he had long since concluded they had been brother and sister. She was angelically fair, and, young as she was, she could not have been more than six years old, her dark blue eyes had a beauty of mind which must have been remarkable twenty years later. Her pouting mouth was like a little scarlet serpent, her skin almost transparent, her pale hair fell waving, not curled with the orthodoxy of childhood, about her tender bare shoulders. She wore a long white frock and clasped tightly against her breast a doll far more gorgeously arrayed than herself. Behind her were the ruins and woods of Chillingsworth. Orth had studied this portrait many times for the sake of an art which he understood almost as well as his own but today he saw only the lovely child. He forgot even the boy in the intensity of this new and personal absorption. Does she live to grow up, I wonder, he thought. She would have made a remarkable, even a famous woman, with those eyes and that brow, but could the spirit within that ethereal frame stand the enlightenments of maturity? Would not that mind purged, perhaps in a long probation from the dross of other existences, flee in disgust from the commonplace problems of a woman's life. Such perfect beings should die while they are still perfect. Still, it is possible that this little girl, whoever she was, was idealized by the artist, who painted into her his own dream of exquisite childhood. Again he turned away impatiently. I believe I am rather fond of children, he admitted. I find myself watching them on the street when they are pretty enough. Well, who does not like them, he added with some defiance. 
He went back to his work. He was chiseling a story which was to be the foremost excuse of a magazine as yet unborn. At the end of half an hour he threw down his wondrous instrument, which looked not unlike an ordinary pen, and making no attempt to disobey the desire that possessed him, went back to the gallery. The dark, splendid boy, the angelic little girl, were all he saw, even of the several children in that roll-call of the past, and they seemed to look straight down his eyes into the depths where the fragmentary ghosts of unrecorded ancestors gave faint musical response. The dead's kindly recognition of the dead, he thought, but I wish these children were alive. For a week he haunted the gallery, and the children haunted him. Then he became impatient and angry. I am mooning like a barren woman, he exclaimed. I must take the briefest way of getting these youngsters off my mind. With the help of his secretary, he ransacked the library and finally brought to light the gallery catalog which had been named in the inventory. He discovered that his children were the Viscount Tancred and the Lady Blanche Mortlake, son and daughter of the second Earl of Tynemouth. Little wiser than before, he sat down at once and wrote to the present Earl, asking for some account of the lives of the children. He awaited the answer with more restlessness than he usually permitted himself, and took long walks, ostentatiously avoiding the gallery. I believe those young children have possessed me, he thought, more than once. They certainly are beautiful enough, and the last time I looked at them in that waning light, they were fairly alive. Would that they were in scampering about this park. Lord Tynemouth, who is intensely grateful to him, answered promptly. I am afraid, he wrote, that I don't know much about my ancestors those who didn't do something or other, but I have a vague remembrance of having been told by an aunt of mine, who lives on the family traditions, she isn't married, that the little chap was drowned in the river, and that the little girl died too. I mean, when she was a little girl. Wasted away, or, or something. I'm such a beastly idiot about expressing myself that I wouldn't dare to write to you at all if you weren't really great. That is actually all I can tell you, and I am afraid the painter was their only biographer. The author was gratified that the girl had died young, but grieved for the boy. Although he had avoided the gallery of late, his practiced imagination had evoked from the throngs of history the high-handed and brilliant, surely adventurous career of the third Earl of Tynemouth. He had pondered upon the deep delights of directing such a mind and character, and had caught himself envying the dust that was older still. When he read of the lad's early death, in spite of his regret that such promise should have come to naught, he admitted to a secret thrill of satisfaction that the boy had so soon ceased to belong to anybody. Then he smiled with both sadness and humor. What an old fool I am, he admitted. I believe I not only wish these children were alive, but that they were my own. The frank admission proved fatal. He made straight for the gallery. The boy, after the interval of separation, seemed more spiritedly alive than ever. The little girl, to suggest with her faint, appealing smile, that she would like to be taken up and cuddled. I must try another way, he thought desperately, after that long communion. I must write them out of me. He went back to the library and locked up the tour de force which had ceased to command his classic faculty. At once he began to write the story of the brief lives of the children, much to the amazement of that faculty, which was little accustomed to the simplicities. Nevertheless, before he had written three chapters, he knew that he was at work upon a masterpiece, and more. He was experiencing a pleasure so keen that once and again his hand trembled, and he saw the page through a mist. Although his characters had always been objective to himself and his more patient readers, none knew better than he, a man of no delusions, that they were so remote and exclusive as barely to escape being mere mentalities. 
They were never the pulsing, living creations of the more full-blooded genius. But he had been content to have it so. His creations might find and leave him cold, but he had known his highest satisfaction in chiseling the statuettes, extracting subtle and elevating harmonies, while combining words as no man of his tongue had combined them before. But the children were not statuettes. He had loved and brooded over them long ere he had thought to tuck them into his pen, and on its first stroke they danced out alive. The old mansion echoed with their laughter, with their delightful and original pranks. Mr. Orth knew nothing of children, therefore all the pranks he invented were as original as his faculty. The little girl clung to his hand or knee as they both followed the adventurous course of their common idol, the boy. When Orth realized how alive they were, he opened each room of his home to them in turn, that evermore he might have sacred and poignant memories with all parts of the stately mansion where he must dwell alone to the end. He selected their bedrooms and hovered over them, not through infantile disorders which were beyond even his imagination, but through those painful intervals incident upon the enterprising spirit of the boy and the devoted obedience of the girl to fraternal command. He ignored the second Lord Tynemouth. He was himself their father, and he admired himself extravagantly for the first time. Art had chastened him long since. Oddly enough, the children had no mother, and not even memory of one. He wrote the book more slowly than was his wont, and spent delightful hours pondering upon the chapter of the morrow. He looked forward to the conclusion with a sort of terror, and made up his mind that when the inevitable last word was written, he should start at once for Hamburg. In calculable times a day he went to the gallery, for he no longer had any desire to write the children out of his mind, and his eyes hungered for them. They were his now. It was with an effort that he sometimes humorously reminded himself that another man had fathered them, and that their little skeletons were under the choir of the chapel. Not even for peace of mind would he have descended into the vaults of the lords of Chillingsworth and looked upon the marble effigies of his children. Nevertheless, when in a superhumorous mood he dwelt upon his high satisfaction in having been enabled by his great aunt to purchase all that was left of them. For two months he lived in his fool's paradise, and then he knew that the book must end. He nerved himself to nurse the little girl through her wasting illness, and when he clasped her hands, his own shook. His knees trembled. Desolation settled upon the house, and he wished he had left one corner of it to which he could retreat unhaunted by the child's presence. He took long tramps, avoiding the river with a sensation next to panic, it was two days before he got back to his table, and then he had made up his mind to let the boy live. To kill him off, too, was more than his augmented stock of human nature could endure. After all, the tad's death had been purely accidental, wanton. It was just that he should live with one of the author's inimitable suggestions of future greatness. But at the end, the parting was almost as bitter as the other. Orth knew then how men feel when their sons go forth to encounter the world and ask no more of the old companionship. The author's boxes were packed. He sent the manuscript to his publisher an hour after it was finished. He could not have given it a final reading to have saved it from failure, directed his secretary to examine the proof under a microscope, and left the next morning for Hamburg. There, in inmost circles, he forgot his children. He visited in several of the great houses of the continent until November, then returned to London to find his book the literary topic of the day. His secretary handed him the reviews, and for once, in a way, he read the finalities of the nameless. He found himself hailed as a genius and compared in astonished phrases to the prodigiously clever talent which the world for twenty years had isolated under the name of Ralph Orth. This pleased him, for every writer is human enough to wish to be hailed as a genius, and immediately. 
Many are, and many wait. It depends upon the fashion of the moment and the needs and bias of those who write of writers. Orth had waited twenty years, but his past was bedecked with the headstones of geniuses long since forgotten. He was gratified to come thus publicly into his estate, but soon reminded himself that all the adulation of which a belated world was capable could not give him one thrill of the pleasure which the companionship of that book had given him while creating. It was the keenest pleasure in his memory, and when a man is fifty and has written many books, that is saying a great deal. He allowed that society was in town to lavish honors upon him for something over a month, then canceled all his engagements and went down to Chillingsworth. His estate in Hertfordshire, that county of gentle hills and tangled lanes, of ancient oaks and wide, wild heaths, of historic houses and dark woods, and green fields innumerable, a Wordsworthian shire steeped in the deepest peace of England. As Orth drove towards his own gates, he had the typical English sunset to gaze upon, a red streak with a church spire against it. His woods were silent. In the fields the cows stood as if conscious of their part. The ivy on his old gray towers had been young with his children. He spent a haunted night, but the next day stranger happenings began. Chapter 2 he rose early and went for one of his long walks. England seems to cry out to be walked upon, and Orth, like others of the transplanted, experienced to the full the country's gift of foot restlessness and mental calm. Calm flees, however, when the ego is rampant, and today, as upon others too recent, Orth's soul was as restless as his feet. He had walked for two hours when he entered the wood of his neighbor's estate, a domain seldom honored by him, as it too had been bought by an American, a flighty, hunting widow who displeased the fastidious taste of the author. He heard children's voices and turned with a quick prompting of retreat. As he did so, he came face to face on the narrow path with a little girl, for the moment he was possessed by the most hideous sensation which can visit a man's being, abject terror. He believed that body and soul were disintegrating. The child before him was his child, the original of a portrait in which the artist, dead two centuries ago, had missed exact fidelity after all. The difference, even as rolling vision took note, lay in the warm, pure, living whiteness and the deeper spiritual suggestion of the child in his path. Fortunately, for his self-respect, the surrender lasted but a moment. The little girl spoke. You look real sick, she said. Shall I lead you home? The voice was soft and sweet, but the intonation, the vernacular, were American and not of the highest class. The shock was, if possible, more agonizing than the other. But this time Orth rose to the occasion. Who are you? he demanded with asperity. What is your name? Where do you live? The child smiled, an angelic smile, although she was evidently amused. I never had so many questions asked me all at once, she said. But I don't mind, and I'm glad you're not sick. I'm Mrs. Jenny Root's little girl. My father's dead. My name is Blanche. You are sick. No? And I live in Rome, New York State. We've come over here to visit Pa's relations. Orth took the child's hand in his. It was very warm and soft. Take me to your mother, he said firmly. Now, at once. You can return and play afterwards. And, as I won't have you disappointed for the world, I'll send you to town today for a beautiful doll. The little girl, whose face had fallen, flashed her delight, but walked with great dignity beside him. He groaned in his depths as he saw they were pointing for the widow's house, but made up his mind that he would know the history of the child and of all her ancestors if he had to sit down at the table with his obnoxious neighbor. 
To his surprise, however, the child did not lead him into the park, but towards one of the old stone houses of the tenantry. Pa's great-great-great-grandfather lived there, she remarked, with all the American's pride of ancestry. Orth did not smile, however. Only the warm clasp of the hand in his, the soft, thrilling voice of his still mysterious companion, prevented him from feeling as if moving through the mazes of one of his own famous ghost stories. The child ushered him into the dining room, where an old man was seated at the table reading his Bible. The room was at least eight hundred years old. The ceiling was supported by the trunk of a tree, black and probably petrified. The windows had still their diamond panes, separated, no doubt, by the original lead. Beyond was a large kitchen in which were several women. The old man, who looked patriarchal enough to have laid the foundations of this dwelling, glanced up and regarded the visitor without hospitality. His expression softened as his eyes moved to the child. "'Who have you brought?' he asked. He removed his spectacles. "'Ah!' He rose and offered the author a chair. At the same moment, the women entered the room. "'Of course you've fallen in love with Blanche, sir,' said one of them. "'Everybody does.' "'Yes, that is it. Quite so.' Confusion still prevailing among his faculties, he clung to the naked truth. "'This little girl has interested and startled me, because she bears a precise resemblance to one of the portraits in Chillingsworth.' painted about two hundred years ago. Such extraordinary likenesses do not occur without reason, as a rule, and, as I admired my portrait so deeply that I have written a story about it, you will not think it unnatural if I am more than curious to discover the reason for this resemblance. The little girl tells me that her ancestors lived in this very house, and as my little girl lived next door, so to speak, there is undoubtedly a natural reason for the resemblance. His host closed the Bible, put his spectacles in his pocket, and hobbled out of the house. "'He'll never talk of family secrets,' said an elderly woman, who introduced herself as the old man's daughter, and had placed bread and milk before the guest. "'There are secrets in every family, and we have ours, but he'll never tell those old tales. All I can tell you is that an ancestor of little Blanche went to wreck and ruin because of some fine lady's doings and killed himself. The story is that his boys turned out bad. One of them saw his crime and never got over the shock. He was foolish-like after. The mother was a poor, scared sort of creature and hadn't much influence over the other boy. There seemed to be a blight on all the man's descendants until one of them went to America. Since then, they haven't prospered exactly, but they've done better, and they don't drink so heavy. They haven't done so well, remarked a worn, patient-looking woman. Orth typed her as belonging to the small, middle class of an interior town of eastern United States. You are not the child's mother. Yes, sir. Everybody is surprised. You needn't apologize. She doesn't look like any of us, although her brothers and sisters are good enough for anybody to be proud of. But we all think she strayed in by mistake, for she looks like any lady's child. And, of course, we're only middle class. Orth gasped. It was the first time he had ever heard a Native American use the term middle class with a personal application. For the moment, he forgot the child. His analytical mind raked in the new specimen. He questioned and learned that the woman's husband had kept a hat store in Rome, New York, that her boys were clerks, her girls in stores or typewriting. They kept her and little Blanche, who had come after her other children were well-grown, in comfort, and they were all very happy together. The boys broke out occasionally, but on the whole were the best in the world and her girls were worthy of far better than they had. All were robust except Blanche. She coming so late, when I was no longer young, makes her delicate, she remarked, with a slight blush, the signal of her chaste Americanism. But I guess she'll get along all right. She couldn't have better care if she were a queen's child. Orth, who had gratefully consumed the bread and milk, rose. Is that really all you can tell me, he asked? 
That's all, replied the daughter of the house, and you couldn't pry open father's mouth. Orth shook hands cordially with all of them, for he could be charming when he chose. He offered to escort the little girl back to her playmates in the wood, and she took prompt possession of his hand. As he was leaving, he turned suddenly to Mrs. Root. Why did you call her Blanche? he asked. She was so white and dainty, she just looked it. Orth took the next train for London, and from Lord Tynemouth obtained the address of the aunt who lived on the family traditions and a cordial note of introduction to her. He then spent an hour anticipating in a toy shop the whims and pleasures of a child, an incident of paternity which his book children had not inspired. He bought the finest doll, piano, French dishes, cooking apparatus, and playhouse in the shop, and signed a check for thirty pounds with a sensation of positive rapture. Then he took the train for Lancashire, where the lady, Mildred Mortlake, lived in another ancestral home. Possibly there are few imaginative writers who have not a leaning, secret or avowed, to the occult. The creative gift is in very close relationship with the great force behind the universe. For aught we know, may be an atom thereof. It is not strange, therefore, that the lesser and closer of the unseen forces should send their vibrations to it occasionally, or, at all events, that the imagination should incline its ear to the most mysterious and picturesque of all beliefs. Orth frankly dallied with the old dogma. He formulated no personal faith of any sort, but his creative faculty, that ego within an ego, had made more than one excursion into the invisible and brought back literary treasure. The Lady Mildred received with sweetness and warmth the generous contributor to the family sieve and listened with fluttering interest to all he had not told the world. She had read the book and to the strange Americanized sequel. I am all at sea, concluded Orth. What had my little girl to do with the tragedy? What relation was she to the lady who drove the young man to destruction? The closest, interrupted Lady Mildred. She was herself. Orth stared at her again. Again he had a confused sense of disintegration. Lady Mildred, gratified by the success of her bolt, proceeded less dramatically. Wally was up here just after I read your book, and I discovered he had given you the wrong history of the picture. Not that he knew it. It is a story we have left untold as often as possible, and I tell it to you only because you would probably become a monomaniac if I didn't. Blanche Mortlake, that Blanche, there had been several of her name, but there has not been one since, did not die in childhood, but lived to be twenty-four. She was an angelic child, but little angels sometimes grow up into very naughty girls. I believe she was delicate as a child, which probably gave her that spiritual look. Perhaps she was spoiled and flattered until her poor little soul was stifled, which is likely. At all events, she was the coquette of her day. She seemed to care for nothing but breaking hearts, and she did not stop when she married either. She hated her husband and became reckless. She had no children. So far, the tale is not an uncommon one, but the worst, and what makes the ugliest stain in our annals is to come. She was alone one summer at Chillingsworth. Here she had taken temporary refuge from her husband, and she amused herself, some say fell in love, with a young man of the yeomanry, a tenant of the next estate. His name was Root. He, so it comes down to us, was a magnificent specimen of his kind, and in those days the yeomanry gave us our great soldiers. His beauty of face was quite as remarkable as his physique. He led all the rural youth in sport and was a bit above his class in every way. He had a wife in no way remarkable and two little boys, but was always more with his friends than his family. Where he and Blanche Mortlake met, I don't know. In the woods, probably, although it has been said that he had the run of the house. At all events, he was wild about her, and she pretended to be about him. Perhaps she was, for women have stooped before and since. 
Some women can be stormed by a fine man in any circumstances. But, although I am a woman of the world and not easy to shock, there are some things I tolerate so hardly that it is all I can do to bring myself to believe in them. And stooping is one. Well, they were the scandal of the country for months, and then, either because she had tired of her new toy, or his grammar graded after the first glamour, or because she feared her husband, who was returning from the continent, she broke off with him and returned to town. He followed her and forced his way into her house. It is said she melted, but made him swear never to attempt to see her again. He returned to his home and killed himself. A few months later she took her own life. That is all I know. It is quite enough for me, said Orth. The next night, as his train traveled over the great wastes of Lancashire, a thousand chimneys were spouting forth columns of fire. Where the sky was not red, it was black. The place looked like hell. Another time Orth's imagination would have gathered immediate inspiration from this wildest region of England. The fair and peaceful counties of the south had nothing to compare in infernal grandeur with these acres of flaming columns. The chimneys were invisible in the lower darkness of the night. The fires might have leaped straight from the angry cauldron of the earth. But Orth was in a subjective world, searching for all he had ever heard of occultism. He recalled that the sinful dead are doomed, according to this belief, to linger for vast reaches of time in that borderland which is close to earth, eventually sent back to work out their final salvation, that they work it out among the descendants of the people they have wronged, that suicide is held by the devotees of occultism to be a cardinal sin, abhorred and execrated. Authors are far closer to the truths enfolded in mystery than ordinary people because of that very audacity of imagination which irritates their plotting critics. As only those who dare to make mistakes succeed greatly, only those who shake free the wings of their brush, once in a way, the secrets of the great pale world. If such writers go wrong, it is not for the mere brains to tell them so. Upon Orth's return to Chillingsworth, he called at once upon the child and found her happy among his gifts. She put her arms about his neck and covered his serene, unlined face with soft kisses. This completed the conquest. Orth, from that moment, adored her as a child, irrespective of the psychological problem. Gradually, he managed to monopolize her. From long walks, it was but a step to take her home for luncheon. The hours of her visits lengthened. He had a room fitted up as a nursery and filled with the wonders of Toyland. He took her to London to see the pantomimes, two days before Christmas to buy presents for her relatives, and together they strung them upon the most wonderful Christmas tree that the old hall of Chillingsworth had ever embraced. She had a donkey cart and a trained nurse disguised as a maid to wait upon her. Before a month had passed, she was living in state at Chillingsworth and paying daily visits to her mother. Mrs. Root was deeply flattered and apparently well content. Orth told her plainly that he should make the child independent and educate her. Meanwhile, Mrs. Root intended to spend six months in England, and Orth was in no hurry to alarm her by broaching his ultimate design. He reformed Blanche's accent and vocabulary, and read to her out of books which would have addled the brains of most little maids of six, but she seemed to enjoy them, although she seldom made a comment. He was always ready to play games with her, but she was a gentle little thing, and moreover easily tired. She preferred to sit in the depths of a great big chair, toasting her bare toes at the log fire in the hall, while her friend read or talked to her. Although she was thoughtful, and when left to herself given to dreaming, his patient observation could detect nothing uncanny about her. Moreover, she had a quick sense of humor. She was easily amused, and could laugh as merrily as any child in the world. He was resigning all hope of further development on the shadowy side when one day he took her to the picture gallery. 
It was the first warm day of summer. The gallery was not heated, and he had not dared to take his frail visitor into its chilly spaces during the winter and spring. Although he had wished to see the effect of the picture on the child, he had shrunk from the bare possibility of the very developments the mental part of him craved. The other was warmed and satisfied for the first time, and held itself aloof from disturbance. But one day the sun streamed through the old windows, and obeying a sudden impulse, he led Blanche to the gallery. It was some time before he approached the child of his earlier love. Again he hesitated. He pointed out many other fine pictures, and Blanche smiled appreciatively at his remarks that were wise in criticism and interesting in, in manner. He never knew just how much she understood, but the very fact that were there were depths in the child beyond his probing riveted his chains. Suddenly he wheeled about and waved his hand to her prototype. What do you think of that? he asked. You remember I told you of the likeness the day I met you. She looked indifferently at the picture, but he noticed that her color changed oddly. Its pure white tone gave place to an equally delicate gray. I have seen it before, she said. I came in here one day to look at it. And I have been quite often since. You never forbade me, she added, looking at him appealingly, but dropping her eyes quickly. And I like the little girl and the boy very much. Do you? Why? I don't know. A formula in which she had taken refuge before. Still, her candid eyes were lowered, but she was quite calm. Orth, instead of questioning, merely fixed his gaze upon her and waited. In a moment she stirred uneasily, but she did not laugh nervously as another child would have done. He had never seen her self possession ruffled, and he had begun to doubt he ever should. She was full of human warmth and affection. She seemed made for love, and every creature who came within her ken adored her, from the author himself down to the litter of puppies presented to her by the stable boy a few weeks since. But her serenity would hardly be enhanced by death. She raised her eyes finally, but not to his. She looked at the portrait. Did you know that there was another picture behind? she asked. No, replied Orth, turning cold. How did you know it? One day I touched a spring in the frame, and this picture came forward. Shall I show you? Yes! And crossing curiosity and the involuntary shrinking from impending phenomena was a sensation of aesthetic disgust that he should be treated to a secret spring. The little girl touched hers, and that other Blanche sprang aside so quickly that she might have been impelled by a sharp blow from behind. Orth narrowed his eyes and stared at what she revealed. He felt that his own Blanche was watching him, and set his features, although his breath was short. There was Lady Blanche Mortlake, in the splendor of her young womanhood, beyond a doubt. Gone were all traces of her spiritual childhood, except perhaps in the shadows of the mouth. But more than fulfilled were the promises of her mind. Assuredly, the woman had been as brilliant and gifted as she had been restless and passionate. She wore her very pearls with arrogance, her very hands were tense with eager life, her whole being breathed mutiny. Orth turned abruptly to Blanche, who had transferred her attention to the picture. What a tragedy is there, he exclaimed, with a fierce attempt at lightness. Think of a woman having all that pent up within her two centuries ago and at the mercy of a stupid family, no doubt, and a still stupider husband. No wonder. Today, a woman like that might not be a model for all the virtues, but she certainly would use her gifts and become famous, the while living her life too fully to have any place in it for yeomen and such, or even for the trivial business of breaking hearts. He put his finger under Blanche's chin and raised her face, but he could not compel her gaze. You are the exact image of that little girl, he said, except that you are even purer and finer. She had no chance, none whatever. You live in the woman's age. Your opportunities will be infinite. I shall see to it that they are. 
What you wish to be, you shall be. There will be no pent-up energies here to burst out into disaster for yourself and others. You shall be trained to self-control. That is, if you ever develop self-will, dear child. Every faculty shall be educated. Every school of life you desire knowledge through shall be open to you. You shall become that finest flower of civilization, a woman who knows how to use her independence. She raised her eyes slowly and gave him a look which stirred the roots of sensation, a long look of unspeakable melancholy. Her chest rose once, then she set her lips tightly and dropped her eyes. "'What do you mean?' he cried roughly, for his soul was chattering. "'Is it—do you—' He dared not go too far and concluded lamely. You mean you fear that your mother will not give you to me when she goes. You have divined that I wish to adopt you. Answer me, will you? But she only lowered her head and turned away, and he, fearing to frighten or repel her, apologized for his abruptness, restored the outer picture to its place, and led her from the gallery. He sent her at once to the nursery, and when she came down to luncheon and took her place at his right hand, she was as natural and childlike as ever. For some days he restrained his curiosity, but one evening, as they were sitting before the fire in the hall, listening to the storm, and just after he had told her the story of the Earl King, he took her on his knee and asked her gently if she would not tell him what had been in her thoughts when he had drawn her brilliant future. Again her face turned gray, and she dropped her eyes. I cannot, she said. I, perhaps, I don't know. Was it what I suggested? She shook her head then, looked at him with a shrinking appeal which forced him to drop the subject. He went the next day alone to the gallery and looked long at the portrait of the woman. She stirred no response in him, nor could he feel that the woman of Blanche's future would stir the man in him. The paternal was all he had to give, but that was hers forever. He went out into the park and found Blanche digging in her garden, very dirty and absorbed. The next afternoon, however, entering the hall noiselessly, he saw her sitting in her big chair, gazing out into nothing visible. Her whole face settled in melancholy. He asked her if she were ill, and she recalled herself at once, but confessed to feeling tired. Soon after this he noticed that she lingered longer in the comfortable depths of her chair, and seldom went out except with himself. She insisted that she was quite well, but after he had surprised her again, looking as sad as if she had renounced every joy of childhood, he summoned from London a doctor renowned for a success with children. The scientist questioned and examined her. When she had left the room, he shrugged his shoulders. She might have been born with ten years of life in her, or she might grow up into a buxom woman, he said. I confess, I cannot tell. She appears to be sound enough, but I have no x-rays in my eyes, and for all I know she may be on the verge of decay. She certainly has the look of those who die young. I have never seen so spiritual a child. But I can put my finger on nothing. Keep her out of doors, don't give her sweets, and don't let her catch anything if you can help it. Orth and the child spent the long, warm days of summer under the trees of the park or driving in the quiet lane. Guests were unbidden, and his pen was idle. All that was human in him had gone out to Blanche. He loved her, and she was a perpetual delight to him. The rest of the world received the large measure of his indifference. There was no further change in her, and apprehension slept and let him sleep. He had persuaded Mrs. Root to remain in England for a year. He sent her theater tickets every week, and placed a horse and phaeton at her disposal. She was enjoying herself and seeing less and less of Blanche. He took the child to Bournesmouth for a fortnight, and again to Scotland, both of which outings benefit as much as they pleased her. 
She had begun to tyrannize over him amiably, and she carried herself quite royally. But she was always sweet and truthful, and these qualities, combined with that something in the depths of her mind which defied his explorations, held him captive. She was devoted to him and feared for no other companion, although she was demonstrative to her mother when they met. It was in the tenth month of this ideal of the lonely man and the lonely child that Mrs. Root flurriedly entered the library of Chillingsworth, where Orth happened to be alone. "'Oh, sir!' she exclaimed. "'I must go home. My daughter Grace writes me, she should have done it before, that the boys are not behaving as well as they should. She didn't tell me, as I was having such a good time, she just hated to worry me. Heaven knows I've had enough worry.' But now I must go. I just couldn't stay. Boys are an awful responsibility. Girls ain't a circumstance to them, although mine are a handful sometimes. Orth had written about too many women to interrupt the flow. He let her talk until she paused to recuperate her forces. Then he said quietly, I am sorry this has come so suddenly, for it forces me to broach a subject at once which I would rather have postponed until the idea had taken possession of you by degrees. I know what it is you want to say, sir, she broke in, and I have reproached myself that I haven't warned you before. But I didn't like to be the one to speak first. You want Blanche, of course. I couldn't help seeing that. But I can't let her go, sir. Indeed, I can't. Yes, he said firmly. I want to adopt Blanche, and I hardly think you can refuse, for you must know how greatly it will be to her advantage. She is a wonderful child. You have never been blind to that. She should have every opportunity, not only of money, but of association. If I adopt her legally, I shall, of course, make her my heir. And there is no reason why she should not grow up as great a lady as any in England." The poor woman turned white and burst into tears. "'I've sat up nights and nights struggling,' she said when she could speak. "'That and missing her, I couldn't stand in her light, and I let her stay. "'I know I oughtn't to, now, I mean stand in her light. "'But, sir, she is dearer than all the others put together. "'Then live here in England, at least for some years longer. "'I will gladly relieve your children of your support.' and you can see Blanche as often as you choose. I can't do that, sir. After all, she is only one, and there are six others. I can't desert them. They all need me, if only to keep them together. Three girls unmarried and out in the world, and three boys just a little inclined to be wild. There is another point, sir. I don't know exactly how to say it. Well, asked Orth kindly, the American woman thought him the ideal gentleman, although the mistress of the estate on which she visited called him a boor and a snob. It is... Well, you must know, you can't imagine, that her brothers and sisters just worship Blanche. They save their dimes to buy her everything she wants, or used to want. Heaven knows what will satisfy her now, although I can't see that she's one bit spoiled. But she's just like a religion to them. They're not much on church, I'll tell you, sir. What I couldn't say to anyone else, not even to those relations who have been so kind to me. But there's a wildness, just a streak in all of my children, and I believe, I know it's Blanche that keeps them straight. My girls get bitter sometimes. Work all the week and little fun, not caring for common men and no chance to marry gentlemen. And sometimes they break out and talk dreadful then. When they're over it, They'll say they live for Blanche. They've said it over and over, and they mean it. Every sacrifice they've made for her, and they've made many, has done them good. It isn't that Blanche ever says a word of the preachy sort, or has anything of the Sunday school child about her, or even tries to smooth them down when they're excited. It's just herself. The only thing she ever does is sometimes to draw herself up and look scornful and that nearly kills them. Little as she is, they're crazed about having her respect. I've grown superstitious about her. Until she came, I used to get frightened, terribly sometimes, and I believe she came for that. So, you see, 
I know Blanche is too fine for us and ought to have the best, but then they are to be considered too. They have their rights, and they've got much more good than bad in them. I don't know. I don't know. It's kept me awake many nights. Orth rose abruptly. Perhaps you will take some further time to think it over, he said. You can stay a few weeks longer. The matter cannot be so pressing as that. The woman rose. I've thought this, she said. Let Blanche decide. I believe she knows more than any of us. I believe that whichever way she decided would be right. I won't say anything to her, so you won't think I'm working on her feelings. And I can trust you. But she'll know. Why do you think that? asked Orth sharply. There is nothing uncanny about the child. She is not yet seven years old. Why should you place such a responsibility upon her? Do you think she's like other children? I know nothing of other children. I do, sir. I've raised six, and I've seen hundreds of others. I never was one to be a fool about my own, but Blanche isn't like any other child living. I'm certain of it. What do you think? And the woman answered, according to her lights, I think she's an angel, and came to us because we needed her. And I think she is Blanche Mortlake, working out the last of her salvation, thought the author, but he made no reply, and was alone in a moment. It was several days before he spoke to Blanche, and then, one morning when she was sitting on her mat on the lawn with the light frill upon her, he told her abruptly that her mother must return home. To his surprise, but unutterable delight, she burst into tears and flung herself into his arms. "'You need not leave me,' he said, when he could find his own voice. "'You can stay here always and be my little girl. It all rests with you.' "'I can't stay,' she sobbed. "'I can't.' "'And that is what made you so sad once or twice?' he asked, with a double eagerness. She made no reply. "'Oh,' he said passionately, "'give me your confidence, Blanche. "'You are the only breathing thing that I love.' "'If I could, I would,' she said. "'But I don't know. Not quite. "'How much do you know?' But she sobbed again and would not answer. He dared not risk too much. After all, the physical barrier between the past and present was very young. Well, well then, we will talk about the other matter. I will not pretend to disguise the fact that your mother is distressed at the idea of parting from you and thinks it would be as sad for your brothers and sisters, whom she says you influence for their good. Do you think that you do? Yes. How do you know this? Do you know why you know everything? No, my dear, and I have great respect for your instincts. But your sisters and brothers are now old enough to take care of themselves. They must be of poor stuff if they cannot live properly without the aid of a child. Moreover, they will be marrying soon. That will also mean that your mother will have many little grandchildren to console her for your loss. I will be the one bereft if you leave me. I am the only one who really needs you. I don't say I will go to the bad, as you may have very foolishly persuaded yourself your family will do without you, but I trust your instincts to make you realize how unhappy, how inconsolable I shall be. I shall be the loneliest man on earth. She rubbed her face deeper into his flannels and tightened her embrace. Can't you come too? she asked. No, you must live with me wholly or not at all. Your people are not my people. Their ways are not my ways. We should not get along. And if you lived with me over there, you might as well stay here, for your influence over them would be quite as removed. Moreover, if they are of the right stuff, the memory of you will be quite as potent for good as your actual presence. Not unless I died. Again, something within him trembled. "'Do you believe you are going to die young?' he blurted out. But she would not answer. He entered the nursery abruptly the next day and found her packing her dolls. When she saw him, she sat down and began to weep hopelessly. He knew then that his fate was sealed. And when, a year later, he received her last little scrawl, he was almost glad that she went when she did.' 
end of The Bell in the Fog by Gertrude Atherton. Read by John 